welcome you that are webcasting with us tonight, and I thank you for tuning in. I want you to take a few minutes, if you would, and call your friends and your family. We're going to play a video here in a few minutes that is about an hour long, but this video is going to give you this real large overview on the subject matter that we're going to be teaching over the next several weeks, and that is off of this book, One Race, One Blood, and it's a study from uh, Ken Ham and uh, the Answers in Genesis man. Ken Ham is the one that uh, is behind the Noah's Ark being built up in uh, Cincinnati, Kentucky area. Uh, we went to see that ark. It's something to see. We also went to the Creation Museum. That is something to see. If you want to take an, a nice trip, I would recommend that. Uh, the Creation Museum is like about 30 miles away from the ark. The Creation Museum is just a, oh, it is a powerful, powerful museum. And then to see the ark. The ark is the largest wood frame structure in the entire world. And it's sitting there, right there as Cincinnati, Kentucky or Cincinnati, Ohio, but it's on the west side of the river from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, what a blessing it was to go there to see that. And I, we took the grandkids. Uh, I think it's a, something that is a really just a must-do trip, I think, but everyone has their opinions. We are experiencing, in the world that we're living in, turmoil that is prophetic, not pathetic, prophetic, but pathetic. It is a turmoil that is prophesied will come, a turmoil that uh, fits in the biblical description of the end times. And so uh, we're seeing all kinds of rioting in the streets. I saw on the news yesterday that in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, this area where this man lost his life there, the, uh, the, the police are not anywhere in that area, and the, the rioters and the protesters and whoever is out there uh, to uh, be seen and heard or uh, to destroy whatever is in their heart to do, they're now carrying weapons apparently openly out in the streets. I shared a couple of weeks ago at church that uh, I gave a warning, don't be surprised when you see on television, on the news, or just live stream breaking in on, on our television programs, the police in hand-to-hand -hand combat type shootouts with the public, and then our military being brought in. Uh, don't don't be surprised, because when you get to a place where we're at today, um, the pent up anger and then the condition of man. The truly the condition of man is what we're going to be studying, because ultimately, it's the condition of a man's heart is what directs his actions, and so. Uh, terms like racism and prejudice and discrimination and white and black races are common in the media and in our culture. We have been programmed to classify people based almost solely on physical characteristics. The so-called racial divisions are usually rooted in evolutionary ideas, but racism has no, absolutely no basis in Scripture. You're going to learn that tonight in this video. And then we're going to go back, and for about 12 weeks, we're going to just go into this piece at a time, and we're going to just go through the Word of God and show you God's view on humanity, man's view on God, and what sin has done to the world. So... Acts 17 and verse 26, the Bible says, And God made from 
from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined or allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. Go back and read that passage. I read it today. And uh, that's, an, that's a real eye-opener, just truth here in the New Testament to us. Romans 5 and verse 12 and verse 17 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For, for it, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We're going to learn about Jesus Christ uh, being declared as the second Adam. He is the one that comes to restore us. Sin destroyed us or took us in the absolute direction of uh, human flesh, flesh driven, where God gave us the right to choose the ability to choose, and we do indeed choose. When salvation comes, part of salvation is that something happens in us, and we hear the word of truth, and then something happens in us. It looks like we choose Christ. And in ways, it, it's information that comes to our mind and this information comes to our mind causing our thought processes to explore and to uh, to reach towards these thought processes and so you come up with the word choice or he chose or he accepted Christ that's kind of another one of those words that he accepted Christ it's, it's a I don't particularly like that uh, the way of, uh, of explaining how a person that a person is saved but yet it's 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 information that comes into our mind we come to Christ after we've heard the word of truth and we have trusted in him through this word of truth and it becomes the gospel of our salvation and we become believers well that thought process we use the, the word choose or select or come to Christ, uh, or accepted Christ. I really think that the truer explanation is that God accepted us and offered us Christ. And because we've heard the word of truth, we humble ourselves and embrace that, and that's truly how you're saved. If you come to uh, declare that you are, have received Christ and you don't humble yourself and embrace this gift that's being offered to you, I have very little um, confidence in a salvation that is just strictly a mind, uh, okay, let's see, okay, this, 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 this. And there's just no, uh, doesn't se seem in the testimony, it's just a mechanical thing. But the Bible definitely says it's not a mechanical thing, it's a drawing thing. The word of truth comes in, and, this, and then the, the Lord draws you to himself. There's this, it's like a magnet, you know, and, uh, and that's how we become uh, children of God. So, What? The Holy Spirit is the magnet, yeah. The word of truth, uh, the word of truth uh, becomes the, the carbon in us. You know, and metal, stainless steel, that real shiny metal, or it's, a, it's not a dark metal, it's, a, it's a more of a shiny metal like aluminum. And aluminum is the same, but they, neither one of those two metals have any carbon in them. And so you took, take a magnet and you stick them up to them, and the magnet will not draw them at all because there's no carbon but the word of truth is like the carbon <laughs> that comes in, into us and, and 
causes us to be allowed, uh, it works on us to be drawn uh, to God. Amen? So this video, Ken Ham, uh, the guy that uh, is behind the ark being built up in, up in uh, Cincinnati, Kentucky, he's going to talk to us here for about an hour, and then uh, we might have a minute or two for discussion after that. But he's going to talk to us on this subject, one race and one blood. So let's get, go ahead and get started on that. If anybody wants a pen to make notes, you can. If anyone needs a paper to, to make notes on, let me know. I'll let you take one of these and scribble all over it. Speak. Please silence all cell phones. And please note that emergency exits are located up front, to your right and left, and along the left side of the room. Now, let's give our full attention and a warm welcome to Ken Ham. Well, good morning. Well, it's great to have you all here at the Creation Museum. I'll always start a few minutes early. Uh, you're here actually in Legacy Hall, so you're in this area right here. And ever since the Ark opened, because of the numbers of people coming, we doubled attendance at the Creation Museum, so we had to build this big new parking lot down here. And this, was, this photo was taken after hours, but uh, this is uh, the complex here. You know, we've got the zip lines across the lake here, and then they go all through the trees down here as well. And so it's an incredible zip line course. At the Ark, the zip lines go over the valleys and some of them are 2,000 feet long. So the Ark complex, who's already been to the Ark? Okay, who's going to the Ark? Okay, so majority haven't been there yet. So you get dropped off in this area right here, uh, or sorry, right here, in front of the lake. And this is a great place for a photograph right here with the Ark in the background here. This big building is going up here as our 2,500 seat uh, auditorium that'll be finished by the end of the year, still got to put a big 10,000 square foot lobby on here. And there's a basement as well for workshop areas. This is Village Market, but the way you enter the Ark, you come down here to Monument Walk and you enter down here and into the Q Line Gardens around here and you come in uh, through the back onto Deck 1. This is uh, uh, one of the largest restaurants in America, 1,500 seats. And uh, actually, we're going to do more than that. So some days we feed 3,000 people in there and it's an incredible uh, buffet. This is, this is Rainbow Gardens. This area you'll see under construction, that's the zoo being expanded right there. And the zoo is here. Go down to, uh, through Rainbow Gardens to get the zoo. And then when the new expansion is open, <clears throat> part of this will be open before the end of the year. There'll be a stage here for some live animal programs as well, all from a Christian creationist perspective. And uh, so, it is uh, an incredible place. Actually, both of these, are the, uh, the Creation Museum and the Ark, are two of the world's leading Christian-themed attractions. So I'd be interested to uh, find out where you all come from. You know, I was just wondering if I, I might show you something. Because yesterday, uh, yesterday I had to run away. Uh, I'm speaking every day this week. And yesterday I had to run away because I had to get a flight to... Uh, to New York City, and I thought I'd show you if I can bring these up here and show you what I was doing there with our advertising agency. And this is impromptu, is why I didn't have it ready. That's okay. Let's see if these open. Uh, okay, there we go. So I met that guy and told him all about the ark, and also met that lady. That's Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, many of you know, Jesse Waters. He said he wanted to come out and interview me and ask me if dinosaurs are on the ark. <clears throat> so it could be an interesting interview. And uh, Tucker Carlson, who was really interested uh, in the ark as well. And there was the four of them uh, right there. So there we are. Thought you'd be uh, interested to see that. So that's why I had to run away yesterday and get to New York City and uh, meet with those because uh, we do advertising on Fox News and we're looking at doing some other things and helping get this ministry uh, even more known out there. 
So with that, how many of you in this room are from the state of Kentucky? Man, that's about a hundred times more than normal. That's incredible. That's about 12 people. Okay, how about uh, Indiana? Oh, we have three token people from Indiana. Okay, three from Indiana by the look of it. How about Ohio? Okay, now if you're outside of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, put your hands up. Okay, that's why this area of northern Kentucky, since the Ark has opened and with the Ark and Museum combined, the hotel room demand is four times the national average. And occupancy rate, if any of you know anything about occupancy rates, it's, uh, it's in the um, high 90% which actually means there's not enough hotels, nowhere near enough hotels, which is a limiting factor for us actually. So there's lots more hotels being built, some have already uh, been opened, which is uh, really great. And then how many of you are from another country? I don't mean California, Texas, okay? <laughs> uh, so if you're from another country, if you can put your hands up and I'll get you to yell out where you're from. You're from? Australia. Australia. Did you hear that? <laughs> Australia. It is so good to hear the real language, you know? <laughs> it really is. Actually, we're going back in about a month to visit my mother, who's in her 90s, and spend a little time with her. And uh, it, when we first go back to Australia, we always hear the, the accent, because we're so used to this terrible American thing. <laughs> and we hear the Australian accent. You can actually hear it. And then after a day, you don't hear it anymore. And, oh, isn't this great? Uh, so then we come back to America and then we hear the American accent. Oh, oh anyway. Okay, so the rest of you are from other countries? Yes. You're from Australia too. Whereabouts? Uh, Brisbane. Brisbane. Okay, that's our home city, Brisbane. And you're from Kingscliff, which is just south of the, the Queensland border, really. So the, the Queensland New South Wales border. Excellent. Others? So we got a number of people from Australia today. See, we, we get more people from Australia than we actually do from Indiana. Did you notice that today? <laughs> okay. Yes? I am a now by way of having but I am from California. Gaza, where Oh, yeah, the Gaza Strip. Okay. That's, that's, wow, interesting. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Canada. Canada. That's the 51st state. <laughs> no? Ontario? Okay, we get a lot of visitors from Canada and of course uh, a lot from Ontario because it's very easy to get from Ontario. Anyone else? Yes? Estonia. Es Estonia? Okay, we, we've actually had a number of visitors from there. That's really great. So you see people come from some, anywhere else over here? India. India? Excellent. We get people from all over the world. They come. What's, I, I loved uh, uh, down at the Ark. The, um, we walk around sometimes and you see the diversity of people and the backgrounds and you know, different uh, cultural groups. And uh, one day I was down there, there was a group of Muslims from Baghdad, a group of Catholic nuns, a group of Orthodox Jews and a group of Hindus and then we have all sorts of other different groups and Amish and Mennonite and, and see all these people in, in one place. You normally don't see that sort of mixture in a church. <laughs> but you do at the Creation Museum in the Ark and people do come from all over and I love to see the uh, diversity of uh, backgrounds. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do at the, at the count of three, yell out the state or country you're from. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> oh, I heard 32 American states. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's fascinating to go through the parking lot and look at all the license plates and you'll see people from all over. That's an exhibit in itself. But, and we, we do get Californians here. Anyone from California today here? There we are, see? Are you going back, by the way? Uh, uh, you want to stay out this way, in the Christian part of America? Uh, uh, uh. Anyone, uh, anyone here from Texas? Uh, well, I, we get a lot of people from Texas. That's really great. You don't have an arc as big as what we have here in Texas. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you understood that, okay? 
Actually, you realize the arc is one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field. It's built 15 foot off the ground, so from ground level to the top of the roof is seven stories, to the top of the bow is 10 stories, 3.3 million board feet of timber, and it is a timber frame structure. So it is the biggest timber frame structure in the world. And uh, it's fascinating to go in there and walk through it, and many of you are going to be doing that uh, tomorrow. Well, we have uh, presentations here and concerts and all sorts of different things. It depends on the week, depends on uh, who's here. But uh, this week, uh, I'm doing the presentations at midday uh, every day. I'm doing something different every day, something different to what I do tomorrow. How many of you were here yesterday, by the way, at the presentation? There's a number of you. So we're going to do something a little different today. By the way, I do encourage you, if you want to come back uh, after Thanksgiving, day after Thanksgiving through to December 30, we have Christmas time at the creation. Absolutely fantastic and we have live nativity and all sorts of other things going on and then down at the ark uh, we'll light the ark up in rainbow lights and because we're taking back the rainbow by the way just so you know that and we have all sorts of other things going on there at Christmas time including goats in sweaters and uh, <laughs> Uh, you'll be able to see the spectacular lights we have. This year, we have actually upgraded the lights on the Ark itself to special, we're getting special LED programmable lights. It's going to be spectacular to see all the interaction of the lights on the Ark. So you've got to come back for our, our Christmas programs. Okay, today the topic I want to talk to you about is One Race, One Blood. We're going to deal with the so-called races. And actually, I'm going to explain to you, there are no races of people. So we're talking about where do all the different people groups come from. And I thought I'd start off by telling you where Bill Nye thinks we all came from. So Bill Nye, the science guy, I debated him on this stage here uh, three and a half years ago. And Bill Nye, I call him Bill Nye the humanist guy, or Bill Nye the atheist guy. But the day after the ark opened, I walked him through the ark for two hours and we filmed it all. And it's on a, a DVD uh, that you can uh, get out there uh, called uh, The Second Debate. But two hours, I challenged Bill Nye all the way through the ark. But at one stage, um, we were talking about where humans came from. Oh, let me try that again. So it is not crazy, it's extraordinary, but not crazy to suggest that Mars was hit with an impactor through what's generally called a Hohmann orbit, an orbit where it goes falls toward the sun but ends up on the Earth. You and I are descendants of Martians. Okay, that and that's not, not crazy. And that's not crazy. Is it crazy that you and I are descendants of Adam and Eve? Uh, we are descendants from a common ancestor. I don't but know is it crazy that is it crazy that God made the first man and woman and we're descendants there's, of them? For me, there's no evidence of that. So is that crazy? But I wouldn't use that word. What would you say? It's say uh, you're betraying your intellect. You're not using your head. So, it, so you're saying it is crazy. Okay, so you can believe that we're descendants of Martians, and that's logical and scientific, but to say we're descendants of Adam and Eve, that's basically crazy. Well, what I want to do today is to show you, following on from what I did yesterday about the importance of the book of Genesis, that our whole world view is founded in the Bible and in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, and that we need to be raising up generations who know how to defend their faith and answer skeptical questions. One of the problems is, as I've traveled around the world, it doesn't matter what country I'm in, when people hear you talking about the Bible in this day and age, they say, the Bible, we live in a scientific age. Science has disproved the Bible anyway. I mean, you actually believe in Noah's Ark. He couldn't get the animals on board. You believe in Adam and Eve? Well, wait a minute. Where did Cain get his wife? Where did the races of people come from? What about dinosaurs? Don't they disprove the Bible? Carbon-14 and so on. The trouble is, most of our churches and homes have not raised up generations to know how to answer those skeptical questions of today. How many of you have heard those sorts of questions before, by the way? Put your hands up. You see that? Because that's the era we live in and yet most people don't really know how to answer them and so what I wanted to uh, for the rest of this week following on from what I did yesterday is to teach some apologetics to show you how to answer some of these questions and how important it is to be able to answer them and so we're starting uh, from the Bible building our thinking in regard to looking at uh, the human race if the Bible's account is true which it is we're all descendants of one man and one woman if all human beings are descendants of one man and one woman by the way how many races of people are there? One, so that's easy, we just answered that one, right? <laughs> 
See, think about that because even in church circles, people talk about different races and so on, but there aren't any different races of people. There's only one race. But before we get on to talking more about that, one of the questions that I've been asked about five million times is this. If you believe in Adam and Eve and the Bible says they had Cain and Abel and Seth, then where did Cain get his wife? And you know, the secularists ask those questions. The secularists are going to ask your kids that question. Because it's one of the questions they ask. You believe in Adam and Eve? Okay, where did Cain get his wife? And most people don't even know how to answer that, yet it's very simple. Actually, the Bible has the answer, and science actually helps us understand even more detail. So to start with, let me ask you a question. Can you marry your relation? Yes, no, probably, only after counselling. <laughs> now, I ask that question for this reason, because people usually say you're not allowed to marry your relative. I've got news for you. If you don't marry your relative, then you don't marry a human, then you've got a different sort of problem, okay? Because we're all homo sapiens sapiens, we're all humans, we all belong to the human family, to Adam's family. So when you get married, you marry your relative. And as I talked about yesterday, the doctrine of marriage is based in the Bible in Genesis. When Jesus in Matthew 19 was asked uh, about marriage, he said, haven't you read, he which made the beginning made them, what? Male and female. And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they'll be one flesh. And so the doctrine of marriage is right there in Genesis based on the fact God made male and female. And so it's one man for one woman regardless of what the Supreme Court in America says. It's because God ordained marriage and God invented marriage. So, okay. So we're saying, all right, so the doctrine of marriage is one man for one woman but the Bible only tells us about three males, Cain, Cain and Abel and Seth. Actually, the Bible doesn't just tell us that. See, 1 Corinthians 15.45 says Adam was the first man. So how many men were there to start with? Just one. And Eve was given that name because she was in the Hebrew, it literally reads, to be the mother of all the living. So how many women to start with? One. In fact, Acts 17.26, when Paul's going to the Greeks, he says, God made of one man, or some translations say, from one blood, all nations of men to live on the face of the earth. In other words, we're all related. We all come from one man. And so there's one man and one woman. Okay. And they had Cain and Abel and Seth. Actually, I was in a restaurant in London quite a number of years ago. And the chef found out we were doing a conference nearby and we believed the Bible. He actually came over to our table and said, you believe the Bible? I said, yeah, we believe the Bible. He said, I don't believe the Bible. So I said, why not? He said, well, the Bible says God made uh, Adam and Eve and they had Cain and Abel and Seth. Where would all the people come from then? And I said, oh, Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 says Adam had other sons and daughters. And he looked at us and he said, oh, I didn't read that far. Well, you see, that's the problem with a lot of people. They don't read that far, right? And if you do read the Bible, you realize they had sons and daughters. Get rid of all outside ideas for the moment. If they had sons and daughters and the doctrine of marriage is one man for one woman, then originally brothers married who? Sisters. Now, as soon as you say that, people say, well, wait a minute, you're not allowed to do that and you're not allowed to marry your relative. Actually, you do marry your relative. It's just today it's best not to marry a close relative right and actually you can google it different countries have different rules in regard to what relationships they allow for marriage in in their countries but the principle actually goes back to scripture and actually goes back to Leviticus 18 when God said no longer can close relatives marry now if you think about it Abraham was married to his half-sister and that wasn't a problem but by the time of Moses, God said no longer for close relatives to marry. So why is it close relatives could marry back then, provided it's one man for one woman, but what's, what's the problem today? Well, when Adam and Eve were created, they were perfect. And their genes were perfect. But Adam sinned, and because of sin, God said, if you disobey, you will die you're going to run down, your body's going to run down. In fact, the Bible says the whole of creation, because Adam was given dominion, so the whole of creation fell. And now, God doesn't hold everything together perfectly. And the older you get, the more you understand that. 
and now we run down and die but now there are there are mistakes there are mutations and you see mutations mistakes when genes are copied from one generation to the next they get these mistakes and then then those mistakes to the next generation with additional mistakes so 6,000 years later there's an incredible number of mistakes in the human genome I mean I, I can look around the room and, and, and see them <laughs> staring at me now here, here's the point okay you have so many mistakes today here's the problem if you're closely related brother and sister today will have inherit, inherited those genes from their parents they're more likely to have the same mistakes and so if close relatives married today and you get a fertilized egg you get one set of genes from the male one from the female if they when they get together if they got the same mistakes they tend to reinforce each other and there's an increased likelihood of problems in the offspring Whereas the further away in relationship, it's more likely where one has a bad gene, the other has a good gene that tends to mask the bad gene. And actually, you want to be pleased you've got those good genes masking the bad gene. I and mean, when you look in the mirror and see your eyes a little crooked and your chin's out of whack and your ears are lopsided, and you realize those mistakes are there, right? Um, but they're masked by those good genes, so to speak. And so what I want us to understand is, as you go back in history there would be fewer and fewer of those mistakes and so as you go back in history there's less and less of a problem Adam and Eve were perfect the genes were perfect their children would have not had that many mistakes so there would be no problem with close relatives marrying originally right but today there is that problem and God graciously brought in that rule for us and there's no need actually uh, for close relatives to marry because there's so many people now anyway whereas there wasn't back at the beginning now the other aspect of this is as soon as you say that like I was talking about this on Christian radio once and a man called up and he said I'm an atheist and, a, and if you believe that 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 brothers and sisters married that's immoral I said well sir you're an atheist you can't accuse anyone of being immoral <laughs> right on what do you base your standards that's the first thing I said to him and he said well it's incest and incest is wrong what, 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 see, people are so ignorant when it comes to these issues. Do you realize the English language really didn't come together as a language until about the 1100s, right? And so the word incest wasn't even invented before then. There was no word incest. It, it's a modern word. And today we put a whole range of things under incest, some of which have always been immoral, but not brother and sister marriage in the context of biblical history and provided it's one man for one woman that's what the doctrine of marriage is all about you know it's interesting when I have secularists who who try to you know say oh well that's incest and so on they're trying to make moral judgments which they have no basis for but wait a minute what do they believe that man evolved and man evolved from ape-like creatures and man's just an animal and and people could could mate with whomever and whatever and doesn't matter and you're just an animal and who cares and they think we got a problem <laughs> they're the ones with the problem if you think about it very carefully and you need to know how to answer those to put that back on them so those sort of questions are easy to answer but what about the issue of okay well then we understand that but how come you have distinct people groups in the world I mean when you look around the world you see you can say there's an Australian Aborigine there's an American Indian an Eskimo Fijian and and somebody from from India or somebody from Africa and so we recognize distinct uh, people groups well I want uh, to understand this and again we're building our thinking on the Bible reminding us that if we all go back to Adam and Eve there's only one race so none of these people are different races I, I've actually heard of pastors in churches and sometimes professors at Bible colleges that are taught hey to get all the races of people God must have made different races well no because the Bible tells us there's only one man we're all descendants of that one man which is why we're all sinners which is why the gospel is for every tribe and nation and remember this only Adam's race can be saved God's son stepped into history to be a member of Adam's race right so there are, there are no different races there's Adam's race you have the first Adam and, and Jesus Christ the last Adam who came to save the descendants of Adam so how do we understand all these different um, people groups well to do that we've got to have a little basic course in genetics now you might say I've never studied genetics hey if you're married and have kids you study genetics so we're going to do a little basic course in genetics now here's something else I want you to understand I'm going to give you the big picture basic principles you don't have to be a PhD in genetics to be able to understand this 
Now, if you've got a PhD in genetics, you'll know it's much more complex than this. But nonetheless, these are the basic principles. We have a PhD in molecular genetics on staff, Dr. Georgia Purdom. She uses the same diagrams I use to explain the big picture. Because when you get the big picture, then you can grasp hold of what's going on, even if you're not a scientist or uh, have studied genetics. And so to do that, we're going to start with Genesis 1, where it says that God made land animals according to their kind. In fact, 10 times we read that phrase, according to their kind kind or after their kind in Genesis chapter 1 and so we need to ask ourselves what does that mean according to their kind it seems that each kind remains its own kind and then we meet the word kind again in the English translated from the Hebrew in Genesis 6 when it's talking about two of each kind se seven pairs of some but two of each kind of land animal went on board the ark so we need to understand this word kind and it's going to help us one of the questions people ask is how could Noah get all the animals on the ark when Bill Nye was on this stage debating me one of the things he said was he mocked me for believing in Noah's ark Noah couldn't fit the millions of species on the ark the Bible doesn't say species went on the ark it uses a Hebrew word. In fact, the Hebrew word it uses is the word mean. And we translate the word mean as the word kind. One of the problems we've got is that in the Latin Vulgate, they use the word species. But the word species used to mean what we would say the word kind means. But basically, the word species has been redefined. And so it becomes more complicated. But this is the way to basically understand it. We have a classification system today. It's an arbitrary system man has invented. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now, what we would say is that the Hebrew word mean, translated kind, really in understanding how they define our modern classification system is more at the family level of classification, not genus, not species. In most instances, it's at the family level. And let me explain to you how we came up with that. In fact, at, on the ark, on the first deck, when you get down to the bow end of the first deck, you'll see this cutaway model. And on the wall, you'll see this big sign. And it's good to have a look at that because our scientists worked for years doing research to determine how many kinds Noah would need on the ark. Actually, they've got their 1,400 animal kinds. We've actually overestimated. We think the number of kinds was less than 1,000. But I'll, I'll share with you how they got that figure. If you take dogs, there's been a lot of work done on dogs. You've got lots of different species, 34 species of dogs. Dingoes, wolves, coyotes, jackal, fennet, foxes, domestic breeds, and so on. Well, what they've looked at is all the documented evidence that, oh, this species has bred with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one. This one never bred directly with that one, but it did breed with that one. They bred with this one that bred with that one. You get the idea? You can show they're all interconnected, so they're all one kind because you can show that connection. Now, when it comes to bats, we have a display down there at the Ark on the first deck with some bats in there. And when it comes to bats, nobody's ever shown the different species of bats into breeding, so we let them be separate kinds, but we suspect there's only one kind of bat. It's called bat. That's what we suspect, right? But we allow different kinds just because we don't have the documented evidence. And then in the fossil record, there are creatures that, um, that we allow to be different kinds cause no, because of, they look different, but they look similar. But, you know, you imagine if you found a chihuahua and a, um, a Great Dane in the fossil record, you'd, you'd be hard pressed if you didn't see them alive to think that they were the same kind, right? Well, there are creatures in the fossil record. The problem is you can't see them in the breed because they're dead. Just one dollar. Most of you didn't get that, but <laughs> fossils are dead. They're not alive. They can't, br you, you understand that, right? I, man, I had to start at a different level here for this group. <laughs> okay, so, so we allow a number of different kinds when there's probably far fewer kinds. That's why we think it's less than a thousand. So when you look at our classification system, we have the dog kind, Canada, and that's the family level, different genera, different species, but we would say there's one kind of dog. And the same with cats, Felidae, uh, we'd say that's the family, so that's probably the kind. So that means you don't need two of the dog family and two of the dog, two of the cat family on the ark. So there are 34 different species of dogs. 
you've got all these different species of dogs and here's what the secular world says based on genetic morphological and behavioral data it's clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf now it's interesting that the wolf and the domestic dog are the same species but they say something like this actually over time gave rise to these including these which is sort of hard to understand right and see when you see changes like this evolutionists use these sort of changes as oh it's part of the part of evolution but actually when you see these changes that's the opposite of evolution when you look at what's happening with the dog kind and you get different species and then your domestic uh, species there what's happening overall is a loss of information till you get to the stage where you don't have a lot of information left I mean a poodle is sort of the end of the line in dogs okay <laughs> If it lost any more information, it'd be gone. I mean, that's the end. Okay. Now, we don't know how many dogs God made originally. Let's say he made two dogs, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and then we end up with a typical homeschool family of dogs. Okay, so, now, how do we get the different species, all right? How do we get those? Well, in genetics, we have a convention, big A, big B, big C, dominant genes, little A, little B, little C, recessive genes, remember this? And it's much more complex than this, but this is the basic principle. So here's a male and female dog, and they have a mixture of genes. And so sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the parent, uh, each parent, and you get a combination. Notice that combination there is different to the parents, so it's going to look different to the parents. It's actually got less information than the parents, no longer has little A's, little B's, or little C's. So it's actually lost genetic diversity, all right? But it's going to be a dog. If those two are dogs, it's going to be a dog, right? You look different to your parents because you're a unique combination of information. And by the way, that unique combination is right there at fertilization, which means it's not a part of the mother's body. It's a unique combination. So it's an individual made in God's image, which means abortion is killing a human being. Remember that. So these are the other uh, combinations that you can get. I like to use this one here to represent our purebred, what we call purebred dogs, like poodles, okay? Because how do we get purebred dogs? When we say pure, they're not pure in the sense of perfect, the opposite of that pure in the sense of we've eliminated genetic variability. It's called artificial selection. We say, oh, here's a dog with a short nose, a dog with a short nose, let's breathe them together and eliminate all the genes for long noses. You get the idea? By the way, because we do that, what happens is you're concentrating the mutations that have added up over time because of sin. So if you have one of those purebred dogs, you know, Maltese or uh, Bichon or Poodle or Chihuahua, you know it costs you millions of dollars to keep them alive, right? This breed has eye problems, this one has arthritis problems, this one has breathing problems, isn't that right? I mean, you look at the bulldog, those poor things have got their jaws stuffed up into their face, their nose stuffed into their head, and they can hardly breathe, uh, and we say, what a beautiful little dog. So, see, here, here's a problem we've got, though. I want you to think about this. In a lot of our Sunday school literature and children's books, you know what it says to our kids? Look at these beautiful animals God made. You know, look, look at the poodle. God made the poodle. Uh, think about it. When God made everything, he said it was very good. You can't call a poodle very good. <laughs> do, you know, do you know the correct definition of a poodle, a chihuahua, a bulldog? you know the correct definition of them? Sin-cursed, degenerate, mutated copies of the original dog that God made. That's what they are. So when you look at your little, little dog, you can say, come here, little degenerate mutant, come here. Because so, that's what they really are. Okay? Now, you, you, you think about it. If you've got one of them, you know that you've got to pay a lot of money to keep them alive. That's what keeps the vets in business. If you've got one of those mongrel dogs in, as a mixture of everything in the neighborhood, you can run over them with a truck and they'll get up and wave <laughs> and off they go. So, now, and, and by the way, here's the problem. We tell kids, look at these animals God made, then they go to public school, which the majority of them do, and they're told, do you realize God didn't make them because they have changed? And, and, and these species have come into existence over time and, and your dogs were bred in the last few hundred years which means God didn't make them and evolution's true and then they get indoctrinated and brainwashed. See that's why we've got to make sure we teach them correctly. 
So God didn't make the poodle directly. He made the original dog. You get the idea? We've got, we've got to understand this. We, we don't teach those to our kids in our churches and, and homes and unfortunately they get led astray. And you see, I'm always looking to teach things from a, from a biblical worldview perspective. I had a little elderly lady once come to me and she said, well, is my poodle going to be in heaven with me? Well, you know, I, I try to be gracious and gentle and sensitive, but I just said, well, ma'am, there's no sin in heaven. Uh, so that solved that problem. Okay, so now, let's go on here. I want you to look at this. So, if this is a poodle, if you breed a poodle with a poodle, all you're going to get is what? A poodle. Okay. But if you, could you breed poodles and get back the original dogs? No, because you don't have the genetic diversity. But could you take the original dogs and again get poodles? The answer is what? Yes, you've got that potential. Now, to help us understand, I want you to understand the gen genetic diversity that God has already put in, in creatures. The number of atoms in the universe is said to be 10 to the 80th power. That's a lot of atoms. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, how many children could you potentially have without having two with the same combination of information? It's that number. That number is so big you can't even think about it. People, do you realize something? DNA that builds a dog or a cat or a human is filled with information and it has a language system that reads the information. Matter has never produced a language system by itself and can't. Matter has never been shown to produce one bit of information. There are zillions of bits of information in living systems. Evolution is ridiculous. It can't happen. God made kinds with incredible genetic diversity. And so two of each kind gets on the ark, seven of some, seven pairs of some, Two dogs on the ark, they come off the ark, they increase in number, but they're not going to stay together. As they split up from each other and move away from each other, different combinations of genes will survive in different areas depending on the conditions. It's called natural selection. It's like artificial selection, except it's, it's because of the environment that the selection occurs, not because we choose which one breeds with which. You get the idea? Help us understand. Two dogs get off Noah's ark. S for short hair, L for long hair, S and L give medium hair in dogs, and they have an offspring. Oh, look, it's, here's what they do in the, in the schools. It's got something new, short hair, that's evolution. It's got something new. Do you know what's new? The combination of information. It's actually got less information than the parents. And then you get this one, and then you get this one. Oh, it's got something new, long hair. It's like Darwin's finches. Oh, look, Darwin's finches, bigger beaks and smaller beaks. That's evolution. No, it's just different combinations of the genetic diversity that was already there to give those features. And actually it's got less information than the parents, which is the opposite of evolution. For evolution, you want new information that never existed adding into the genes to produce something that never was there before. That's not what you see. And so over time, what happens? Those that go towards a cold climate, in a cold climate, those with short hair and medium hair get cold and they die. And now you're left with dogs with just uh, L genes, which means on their own, they're only going to produce long-haired dogs. You could get a different species of dog, right? Uh, over time, those that go towards a hot climate, those with long hair and medium hair overheat and they die. And now you're left with dogs with only has S genes. So what's new? Natural selection involves new combinations of already existing information, the genetic diversity that was already there, a loss of information, conserving the information that was there but there's no brand new information that's the opposite of evolution so natural selection is really a downhill process the opposite of evolution and so over time what happens you end up having these animals that adapt in that sense that's what they call adaptation natural selection resulting in different species but it's not evolution think about this for a moment there are 338 breeds of dogs after several hundred years. What can natural processes do in a few thousand years in the wild acting on genetic, created genetic diversity? See, we know much can happen in a short period of time because the genetic diversity already exists. This is the key. Evolutionists say the genetic diversity has to be evolved, has to come about by natural processes. What we're saying, no, that never happens. The genetic diversity is already there, which is why speciation happens quickly. See, if you look at a Great Dane 
and a Yorkshire Terrier. They look very, very different. Did you know that Darwin actually said in England, look at the breeds of dogs, look at the, look at the difference there. So given enough time in the environment by natural processes, you can get these different species a part of evolution. Do you realize the wolf and the coyote are considered to be different species? Look how similar they look. Look at the difference here. And these are the one species. If you can get this difference in dogs, and you, you can breed those differences in a few hundred years, then what Darwin was saying, because you can do that in a few hundred years, over hundreds of thousands of years, look what can happen in the wild. Which is nonsense. It means here that difference is, 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 it doesn't even look that great. It can happen quickly. And the point is you can get massive speciation because of the genetic diversity. Think the kinds on the ark have this massive genetic diversity which in the post-flood world as they move away from each other you can get these different species. You wouldn't expect to see as much speciation today simply because that genetic diversity in a lot of instances has been diluted. And so over time to help us understand here's a wall for jar of jelly beans representing genetic diversity. And over time, you can get less and less genetic diversity till you get to the stage there's just not a lot <laughs> left at all. And by the way, just to go on the record, I hate cats. So you can see that. So Noah needed, Noah needed far fewer animals on the ark than we think he needed. Far fewer. And as we said, probably a thousand kinds. Most animals are pretty small. There was tons of room on the ark, as you'll see when you visit the ark. Now what I want you to do is to apply this to the human kind because the same sort of genetic principles involved. How, how would you get distinct people groups within the one human race? Well you'd have to have something that would split up the human population into groups and isolate them from each other. Can anyone think is there anything in biblical history that explains how that could happen? It's very simple. The Tower of Babel, God gave different languages, you end up with different people groups. And as you go through the Creation Museum and you go through the Ark on the third deck, you'll see that we deal with that in detail. And one of the reasons I, 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 I deal with that, um, the, the book One Blood, One Race we produce, and I speak on this topic, because when I was a teacher in Australia, my very first teaching year in 1975, when I was talking to the students about the fact in the public school that we're all descendants of Adam and Eve and we're all one race and we're all equal and we're all one family, afterwards the Australian Aboriginal kids in the class came up and said, Sir, can you tell us more? And then I realized, of course, Darwin said they were closer to the ape-like creatures than others. And so they were considered the missing links. And here I was telling them, no, you're part of our family. You're related to all of us. And I saw the impact it had on them. And the Lord has given me a burden ever since then to deal with this issue. And I get, I get so frustrated at the racism and prejudice I see even in our churches in America because they don't have a biblical worldview based on Genesis. Because if you did, the church would be leading the way in dealing with racism. Because we know there's only one race. You know, when Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection, the rest of the title was Preservation of Favoured Races and the Struggle for Life. Now, that book was about animals, but at the end, in the last chapter, he said, in the distant future, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Twelve years later, he wrote the book, The Descent of Man, and The Descent of Man inherently is a racist book. It really is. Darwinian evolution inherently is a racist philosophy, but it's taught in our public schools as fact. Now, it's interesting, if you look at some, some things that have happened, like recently, uh, the American Library Association had a, an, uh, an award named after uh, Laura Engels Wilder because of her Little House on, on the Prairie series. And they decided when you look back and read that series, oh, there was racism in there. And uh, so they decided that no longer will they allow that award to be named after her. And we've heard of books being banned and all sorts of things because of so-called racism. Actually, if you read The Little House on the Prairie, Laura Engels, um, she was actually fighting against racism against the Indians, if you read it in the right context. And it's, it's, it's in the context of history that those books are written. Uh, here's the interesting thing. The, the, the girl portrayed in the books was definitely not racist. If you're going to say you've got to ban uh, a, a library awarder because of those books, they should be banning Darwinian evolution from the school system. But of course that's not what they want to do, so they ignore that. 
Y you know, it's interesting. How many of you here have read The Origin of Species by Darwin? Have actually read it? I see a couple of hands, maybe three. How many have read The Descent of Man? I'm not sure I see any hands. Do you, you know, most school teachers, majority, have never read The Descent of Man. Do you know, in fact, most evolutionists don't even know what Darwin taught? You read his books and you'll see what he taught. That's why the late uh, Harvard paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. In Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, he says, this is just one example, at some future period, the civilized races will exterminate the savage races. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider than the Caucasians and some ape as low as a baboon instead of now as between the Negro, Australian Aborigines and the gorilla. Do you realize what he's saying? The Australian Aborigines and, and people from Africa are closer to the apes than the Caucasians. How's that for racism? That's what Darwinian evolution's all about. That's why in 1924 there was a New York Tribune newspaper published that said the missing links were found in Australia, the Australian Aborigines. There were scientists from England and Germany who sent people to Australia to hunt down the Aborigines, to herd them over cliffs or into swamps and, and with instructions on how to skin them and boil up their skulls for specimens in the name of evolution. Do you know in 1925, the year of the Scopes trial, John Scopes supposedly taught from a particular biology textbook about uh, the evolution of man and so on, and actually that was a setup by the ACLU. But did you know uh, the, the textbook that was sort of the center of this trial in a way, and a major biology textbook used in public schools in America in the 1900s and was used in 1925, said this, the races of man and based on Darwinian evolution, at the present time there exist upon the earth five races, the highest type of all represented by the Caucasians, uh, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Generations of kids in the public schools based on evolution were taught the Caucasians are the highest race. And we wonder why we have so much racism and prejudice in our culture. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other factors, I understand that, but I'm saying we've got to recognize that Darwinian evolution itself is inherently a racist philosophy. And in fact, I like to encourage the church. I want to suggest to us that we get rid of the term races. And I'll tell you why. When you go back to the Thomas, say Thomas Jefferson and so on, when you talked about races, you talked about an English race or an Irish race, the word race has changed meaning. The word race used to mean cultural group or ethnic group. But because of the influence of evolution, a lot of people today have been indoctrinated to believe there's lower races, higher races, primitive races, uh, and, and savage races, and, and, and all the rest of it. So people, I'm going to challenge us as a church, we need to get rid of the term races. I want to suggest to us we use the term people groups instead. Because here's the other thing. I will say to you that the, the people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are fueling racism by the very terminology they use, which actually is incorrect. Because they talk about the races and the black people and the white people. There are no races and there really are no truly black or white people. And I'll explain that to you as we go on here. Did you know the secular world knows there's no races? Journal of Counseling Development, 1998, evidence continues to collect the term race is meaningless, used to point out differences in people that are not definitive. When I went to school, I was taught there were these main racial groups, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Australoid. I never knew to ask my professors, how did you get those groups? On what basis? Because we've now found the basis on which they determined those groups was false. When the Human Genome Project headed by an atheist actually, Dr. Venter, mapped the human genome around the world. They collected genes from all around the world, from humans. And you know what they announced to the world in the year 2000? There's only one race, the human race. Wow. Who would have thought of that? You know when they announced that? Do you know what I didn't hear the church doing? Told you! Because if we really believe God's word, if we really believe the book of Genesis, the trouble is because of the compromise with evolution of millions of years and because many even conservative pastors say we're not scientists, we don't know how to deal with Genesis, they've hived Genesis off and said let's tell you about Jesus, but the geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology and Genesis is foundational to our doctrines, foundational to our worldview. And because we so ignored the book of Genesis, we handed generations of kids over to the public school to be indoctrinated in evolutionary ideas, then the church doesn't lead 
the way in regard to racism, it actually helps fuel it. See, Nature Genetics, an evolutionist scientific journal, humans vary only slightly at the DNA level and only a small proportion of this variation separates continental populations or people groups. And this one from the American Biology Teacher, 2000, uh, and where well, is a date there somewhere, but 2011. Here is the biological problem with race. The genetic variation within each of the various ethnic groups of Homo sapiens is greater than that between the various ethnic groups. You know what they're now saying? When you take those different groups that were once classed as races, the genetic diversity within a group is greater than that between the groups. Which means the concept of race is meaningless from a scientific perspective. And in fact, nature genetics, again, the genes that explain phenotypic differences like hair color, skin shade, and so on, between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. And the American biology teacher, 2011, all humans are one race, homo sapiens. There is absolutely no genetic or evolutionary justification for racial categories of humans. New York Times, in regard to the Human Genome Project, 2000, the criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features we are programmed to recognize. And in America, people are programmed to look on the outside, particularly in regard to what they call skin color, black, white. Is that not correct? And then we get people getting up, and our politicians and others, getting up and talking about the black race and the white race, and they fuel racism. And, and I, they, you know what? I think they know this material. I mean, it's out there. It's been there for years. But if they, if they taught this, if the media taught this, then they wouldn't have any controversy out there. And I believe a lot of these people want the division. As Christians, we want everyone united in regard to the word of God and saved for eternity, which is what it's all about. You know, let me give you an example here. People say, well, then how do you get black people and white people? Actually, there are no truly black people or white people. People say, I'm a white person. I don't want to be a white person, to be honest. Not right now. I've got too much to do. See, look, I can prove to you I'm not a white person. That's white. If I look like that, you'd be calling 911. <laughs> do you realize if I got somebody up here that you said is a black person, you put a black sheet of paper beside them, true black, you realize they're not black. Everybody is brown. We, there's one ba basic pigment, it's called melanin, two forms of it. It's more complex than this, but this gives you the basic principle idea. If big A and big B mean a lot of melanin, little A and little B mean a little bit of melanin, if you had all big A's and big B's, you'd have dark skin. Little A's and little B's, light skin. If you had a mixture, middle brown, the world's population, the majority, if you look at the bell curve in regard to skin shade, the majority are middle brown. And to help us understand, this is um, a section through our skin, and the top layer here called the epidermis. At the bottom of the epidermis, there are cells called melanocytes that have little organelles in them, melanosomes, that produce packages of melanin. And so, depending on what genes you have, if you have genes that say you produce a lot of melanin, you'll produce a lot and you'll be dark, dark skin, or genes that produce not so much melanin. When you tan, you will produce melanin, it will stimulate uh, your skin to produce melanin to a maximum that your genes tell you. It's very easy to understand. Those differences in skin shade, not skin color, skin shade, are just minor differences. And they are. Genetically, they're very minor. You see, what shade was Adam and Eve's skin? Not what color. Everyone's the same color. And I'm going to challenge us, and we need to change our terminology. You, you don't talk about what color someone is, it's what shade they are. We shouldn't be talking about races because of Darwin's ideas. Let's talk about people groups. There are people that say, there's a group of colored people. I've heard Al Sharpton get up on, on TV and say, now people of color, and I say, oh, that's everyone. Do you realize everyone in this room is a colored person? If you're not, you've got a problem, okay? Everyone's related to everyone else. Do you realize what a difference it makes when you look at somebody that you don't like and say, they're my relative? And then ask yourself, are they going to heaven? Do you want your family in heaven? See, it makes a big difference the way you look at people when you realize we're all one race, we're all one family. And you know, 
there, there's a lot of applications that, that we can make. For instance, I was at a church and uh, a man came up on stage after I spoke and he said, you mean to tell me there really are no truly black people? I said, that's right. Huh. Because he had very dark shade skin. And he said to me, well, I voted for President Obama because he was black and now you're telling me that was a stupid reason to vote for somebody. I said, yeah, that's a stupid reason to vote for somebody. Because, you know, and you know, as Christians, I use that as an example for the audience, and I said, do you realize, as Christians, you don't vote for somebody because they're black or white, which is not correct anyway, and you don't, we shouldn't vote for somebody because they're Democrat or Republican or Independent. Do you know as Christians what we should be doing, what we should train our kids to understand? Look, there's no one perfect in the world, and, and, and politicians, you know that. Uh, and, what we should be doing is though saying, as Christians, I want to be salt and light, but what I need to do is judge whatever anyone's saying, the, 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 what they say, their behavior, etc., against the absolute authority of the Word of God, then that should drive how I vote. That's being a Christian. You know, uh, another church I was at, uh, was, I remember it distinctly. A man and his wife were sitting with the pastor over on my left, and the man had very dark skin, the pastor had very light skin. People would call that an interracial marriage. There's no such thing as interracial marriage. There's only one race. Biologically, there's no such thing. So when we say that's an interracial couple, what a load of nonsense. There are no interracial couples in the sense of biology. There are spiritually, but not biologically, right? There's a big difference. And I remember the man turned to pastor and he says, this is great, I'm just pleased to know I'm not married to a white woman. <laughs> so there you are. And, and you know, there's other applications. You know when you go to the doctor and, and, and they give you these long forms and you've got to fill out all these stupid things and one of them is, what race are you? I encourage everyone, write down Adams. <laughs> when it says other, Adams. And when the person at the desk says, Excuse me, what's this Adam's race? Adam? Didn't you know Adam was the first man? Did you know we all come from Adam? God created Adam and Eve, and we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, and Adam sinned. And because of sin, that's why death came into the world. That's why we're going to die. You're going to die. You know you're going to die, right? And it's because of sin. And that's why God sent his son. You know the babe in the manger? Die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. You need to, you need to repent. See the gospel in 30 seconds right there. <laughs> Hey, but can you imagine if Christians started doing this sort of thing? You start to be a witness in the community. You say, I'm, I'm going to help lead the way in regard to these issues. And then those songs we learn. Oh, who remembers this one? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. You remember that one? Actually teaches kids wrong ideas. Imagine if we taught generations of kids this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. Now that gives you the right idea. And so, when we think about Adam and Eve, if Adam and Eve had all little A's and little B's, the whole world would be like that. If Adam and Eve had all big A's and big B's, the whole world would be like that. But that lacks the genetic variation we see. And so it makes much more sense that Adam and Eve are in the middle with a mixture, the maximum genetic diversity that God created, just like he did in each of the kinds. And then you get a whole range of variations from that. And that's why, for instance, around the world, there's lots of examples of twins like these. These are from Australia and these primarily from England. Uh, there's lots of examples of twins like this. It's very easy to understand because it depends on the genetic diversity in, in the parents and what combinations they got. And so, over time, because of the Tower of Babel, you could get some groups that only had big A's and big B's. On their own, that's all they're going to produce, dark-skinned people. Over time, you might end up some groups that only have little A's and little B's, only produce light-skinned people. For them, remember, poodles with poodles only give poodles, right? For, for those people to produce kids that had um, a range of skin shade, they're going to have to mix with somebody who's got some of those other genes from the original genetic diversity that God put there. Very easy to understand. And then eye shape, sort of similar. Um, one of the major factors in eye shape is the amount of fat in your eyelids. It's just a minor genetic variation. That's all it is. And as ABC News said, even in 1998, what the facts show is there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. And people, the answer to racism is simple. 
It's the true history of the world. That's the answer to racism. To see people saved, one to the Lord, and to build their thinking on the Bible and to recognize we're all one race, we're all equal before God, we're all sinners, we all need the same solution, Jesus Christ. And you know, when anyone says to me, whether it's in Australia about the Aborigines or anyone else, and they say, yeah, but we were so wronged in our history, and look what happened in history, and look what these people did in history. Do you know what I believe we should say? Do you know what? None of us deserve anything. We didn't deserve what God did for us. We committed high treason against the God of creation. We sinned against God. We, we don't even deserve to exist. Do you realize what he did for us? He stepped into history to pay the penalty for our sin. The, uh, woe is us the, the, that we're sinners, but God wants to save us from what we did. That's the answer. Instead of looking at wrongs of the past and all the rest of it, the answer is we need to see, understand who we are before a holy God. That's the answer. You know, I've already mentioned that there's no such thing as interracial marriage because there's only one biological race. But there are two spiritual races. Being not unequally yoked with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Which is a principle that also applies to marriage. You see, which impending marriage here does God's word clearly counsel against? Does he counsel against this one? Or this one? Or this one? Which one? Clearly see. Biological fact, all humans belong to one race. Spiritual fact, all humans are divided into two races. What is the difference between the two spiritual races? The direction in which they are racing. There's the broad way, which is the world we live in. There's a narrow way within the broad way that goes in the opposite direction. And you know, I've met people who are more concerned their son or daughter not marry someone they think is from a different biological race instead of whether they are of the same spiritual race which is what the doctrine of marriage is all about. And so, the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against is the marriage between the two spiritual races when a Christian knowingly marries a non-Christian. That's the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against. Now I know sometimes there's people who've married and one becomes a Christian and so on, and God has principles to help uh, that, that person and, and, and to win uh, their they love one to the Lord and they mate to the Lord and all the rest of it, but that's a whole other issue. But you know, I've actually had people tell me, but wait a minute, God said the races weren't to mix. Really? Where did he say that? Well, he said the Israelites weren't to marry the Canaanites. Oh, he did actually. Yeah, he did say that. That's true. Let's have a look at that. Let's look at Rahab, who was a Canaanite, lived in Jericho, and... Of course, the Israelites were told not to marry the Canaanites, but it seems the same Rahab is in the lineage leading to Jesus. How could that be? Because she stopped being a Canaanite spiritually and became an Israelite spiritually, believing in the true God, then she's free to marry an Israelite. It was not biological races, it was spiritual races as to why they were told not to marry the Canaanites, because they were pagans. So you see, people, I want to challenge us that we, we look on the outside and we see differences in hair color, eye shape, ear shape, earlobe shape, nose shape, skin shade. Do you realize all those differences are minor genetic differences? They really are. Minor part, a tiny part of our genetic diversity. And the trouble is we, we tend to look on the outside. God gives us a principle that it's the inside that matters. The inside. For instance, when Samuel came to anoint the king, you know, he, had, he didn't know it was going to be David. You can imagine him seeing one of David's brothers, oh, in modern vernacular, tall, handsome, football star at the school. Obviously, he's going to be the king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Next time somebody comes into your church, maybe, um, has a different skin shade to you, instead of looking on the outside, we, we need, to, need to deprogram ourselves to understand that's just a minor genetic difference. We need to look on the inside. Does that person need my, my love? Do they need, do they need the gospel? What do they need? When you see a drug deal on the streets, which there are places you can, what a difference when you say, they're my relatives and they're probably not going 
to, 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 to live with the Lord forever how can I reach them with the gospel maybe there's an inner city mission that I can that I can help maybe I can get our church to make sure we're, we're helping reach these people with the gospel hey we have people that okay are you trained did it help you how many races are there where, where did we come from? How many colors are there? We're all shades of... So let's back up a little bit. Just like he said, I was taught about Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white. Many of you were. But actually, Jesus loves the little children, brown and brown and brown and brown. All shades of brown. What did he point out about what God says about interracial marriages? It's a, huh? It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual, there's two spiritual races, but one human race. We are living, I started out this conversation at 7 o'clock, we're living where we're seeing on our television all this uh, division. And it's prophetic, prophetic times. It's the times that we're living in that are pointing us to the return of Jesus. That's just the truth. You and I, as the children of God, we are trained in truth, which is righteousness. Amen? So today, from this point forward, and you are watching on the webcast today, from this point forward, let's work very, very diligently on changing the conversation. Let's not talk half-cocked or unknowing or without knowledge. Let's stop our conversations where we want to talk about the black race or the Chinese race, or the red race, or the yellow race, or these type of people, and that type of people, because if you go down that road, you're going down that road because you don't know what you're talking about. People groups. People groups. Did you understand when he brought in the, the, the dogs, how he explained it with dog, the dog uh, groups, uh, the, the big A and the little A, and do, do you understand how man has come into all these different shades of brown? Do you understand at the Tower of Babel where God confused their languages and they went all directions around the earth? Do you understand his video uh, presentation where the, the long-haired dogs got in, in a hot environment and over uh, time they die out? They, they do not last in that environment. And the short-haired dogs last in the hot environment, but the short-haired dogs freeze to death in the cold environment. And so humanity has adapted by our environment. They have adapted over uh, generations. Uh, it, it's so crystal clear when you watch this. It doesn't take a lot of head scratching to try to figure it out. What it takes is, on our part, some accepting of the truth and moving forward. Moving forward with the truth. Um, It would do us well, I heard this the other day, 
in a video, but it would do us well to quit talking about colors like the black and the white for Christians to stop using that type of language, that type of terminology, because it's not accurate. It's partial information and not enough information. If, you, if we can go forward and say, oh, that black guy over there, I personally have got to recalculate and really start choosing the right words that would best define what I'm trying to say. Don't we all? Choose the right words that best define what we're trying to say. And if we don't know how to actually get to where we're trying to say, let's be honest enough and say, if you could help me to explain what I'm trying to say so that there's no division in what I'm trying to say, because as he said, what we're really here for is Christ, to win our brothers and our sisters to Christ, all shades of brown to, to Christ, right? All shades of, of, of brown to Christ. Eric is back here t today. I thank God that he's here with us tonight. It's his first Wednesday night that he's been here with us, I think. Uh, but so Eric, look, and he is from Costa Rica. His descendants are from Costa Rica. What color is Eric? He's definitely a darker brown than I am. I compared skin color with Corey today. I'm darker, a definite darker brown than Corey is. If I compare him with most of you, I, I can see Lucas. If I compare my skin color to Lucas's skin color, I am definitely more brown or darker shade of brown than Lucas is. So we're brown and brown and brown and brown. Okay? Does anyone have a comment? Yes. 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 If we, if we go down and start kissing their feet, let's, let, let's go right there, because that's an extreme of what's going on in some places where uh, some of these uh, people are, are saying, uh, we have done you so wrong, and they actually get, get down and they kiss their shoes. Okay, among peoples. That's totally wrong. If someone is hurting, instead of spending a bunch of time on why are they hurting, spend more time on getting them the truth. Because the truth is the only thing that's going to set them free. You can, you can embrace them and cry with them, and, and they're going to walk away. I was studying this today. It's a fact. If you're hurting... And I come, or you come to me, and I just embrace you, and I start crying and, and about how, how uh, slavery and this and that and the other. And we walk away, that will help zero. That's what, they're, that's what they're declaring. There is zero help in that. The only help is truth. The truth. What? No, uh, no. Well, just no. I don't tell them. Don't tell them to get over it. Tell them, hey, how, how many races are there? 
Okay, but take them back to Genesis. But we, we don't argue with them. We cannot argue with those that, that are angry. We can't argue with them, those that are hurting, based on a, anything but a biblical perspective. If we do, if we try to uh, console them with any other perspective but biblical perspective, we are, in essence, hurting them, extending their pain, where if I could get them to, uh, if I could get them to sit down and watch this video, let's say, or let's say that I watch this video enough to where my vocabulary and my memory is working to a point where I can actually explain uh, in love, okay? That's key, too. We don't need to get on, on our high horse about we're Christians and blah, blah, blah. So, but if, if I am truly of Christ, then I am of truth. I have no other choice. There is no other gospel, there is no other truth, but Christ. And so, if we want to continue on with and extend the pain, their pain, the truth of the matter is this. Most people that, that I have a lot of compassion. But you know where most of my compassion, the, 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 the quickest compassion response from me will come from is when I see someone that reminds me of little Jerry and how poor I was and how this I was and that I was. And little Jerry, the little boy within me, if I see somebody hurting like little Jerry or was embarrassed, or felt inferior and insecure. I was extremely inferior. My mother, the religion that we were in, my, I don't know if they made them, but my mother wore a bun on her hair, on her head, every day. And uh, these big old balloon dresses every day, and it was pitiful. And we had no TV, and we had all this, and, and all these rules. But here's my point. It created a boy that was so inferior and insecure. When I smell mothballs today, I think of the Salvation Army store where my mother would take us, and there would be this big bin of clothes, and she would hold up a pair of pants in front of me and say, Oh, that, 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 that what looks like it'll fit you, Jerry. Okay, and then she'll put up a shirt... Uh, Oh, that looks like it'll fit you, Jerry. And I can see that they cost a nickel a piece or a dime a piece or a quarter. When I was 15 years old, I was determined I would never, ever wear another pair of a piece of used clothes. And I went and got my uh, first job where I was really making enough money. I bought all my clothes. I was so insecure that if, if I tried on a pair of pants or a shirt of mine and I wore it for 30 minutes, I would never put that back on because I acknowledged that as dirty and not good enough and therefore I was no longer going to be like I was. I was no longer going to be this poor little boy wearing, wearing clothes with patches on them. You know the iron-on patches? I was never going to be that. So back to compassion. When I find somebody that's like that or, or hurting, I can embrace them and I know all about them. What good is it going to do for me to stand there and cry with them that they're poor when I have the truth? I, I met this little girl back here in the back parking lot the other day. I'm back here working on the cars and I saw her just walking around up here. Come to find out she was a freshman in college. She was from this neighborhood. I talked to her about with the language of success. I encouraged that girl. I did not embrace that she was poor. I didn't embrace her. I didn't tell her I felt sorry for her for any condition that she was in. What I did was promoted Christ. I promoted hard work. I promoted never quit. 
I promoted the strength that's in you was given to you by God. But I never said, I'm sorry, did, uh, your mom and dad divorced or this or that. Or I'm sorry about, I never, I'm not going down that road. Why should I jump on that road and cripple them in any deeper? You got to see it. We're responsible. We're responsible to truth. We're responsible to lead the way with truth. We're responsible to lead the way with nothing but the truth. We are not here to cry with those that are all broken down. We are here to bring them the truth to bring them out. I have been all over the country on the streets with Susie's father's ministry taking help and ministry to these people that are hurting. New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, you name the city. We'd go right to the street at night. They're hurting. We understand. But the only message and hope we had was the message of Christ. We took them something to eat. We took them warm blankets. We took them whatever we could to help them in their condition. But we did not sit down with them and start crying and listening to their story about why. We already understand why. Where our story was how to come out. How to come out. We became the, we were the light and the salt. And that's what I'm telling you. If in our compassion we're no longer the light and the salt, but we're just another crying towel, we are not representing the one that sent us. You understand that? I, it sounds, you understand that? Does that make any sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do we get the, over the inferiority? Okay. So the only way back to, back to the only way to uh, freedom is truth. The truth, the Bible says, sets us free. There's no freedom in any other way. There's no freedom any other way. There's a patch, you know, patches, uh, but it's not freedom. Patches are not freedom. Patches are just temporary help. Now, I'm not saying that, listen to me. I'm not saying if somebody's hurting, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any compassion for their pain. I'm saying you sh if you have true compassion, if you have true compassion, you'll be, you'll be driven with the truth because the truth is the only thing that's going to deliver them from that pain. In my particular life, my inferiority and insecurity, I had to work my way through that. I find myself today at 65 years old I'll say, I'm going to tell you this. I said something in my message Sunday that I need to apologize for. I made a reference to, to my son. I've got my children in Nashville. They do very well. But I, I talked about a July 4th picnic. The context was wonderful about fathers and leading the way. I was sharing about my, my father leading the way and having these hog cookouts and this and that. But then I talked about my son having a hog cookout last July 4th. Do you know what I said that was wrong? Any of you catch it? Did you find my insecurity and my inferiority? It spoke out in big words. How much he spent. That was that little boy, Jerry, that was trying to tell you, uh, I'm not a poor boy anymore. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, this poor boy anymore. That's what I was saying. If one of you will remind me, I'll tell the whole congregation Sunday. But I, I got home Sunday afternoon, I got to thinking about that. I thought, you knucklehead, when are you going to get it? 
When are you going to get it? But it was, I was speaking out of insecurity and inferiority. I know, Corey, I, I'm ready. <laughs> you, you understand? So I hope the answer to that you're hearing me say is, in truth, if we can search the truth ourselves, God, if our desire is set on to know the truth, to be set free, God is going to put us on the path to get us there. If you want to look in the mirror, or your family's mirror, or your rearview mirror, and keep looking at what you've been exposed to instead of what is out there for you, but if you keep looking what you've been exposed to, and you keep identifying what you were exposed to, like I did with my younger life, and not what I can become, you're going to continue to be what you honor. If you want to continue to honor the past, that's where you're going to stay. If you want to honor the future, where Christ can uh, take you from glory to glory to grow you and to cause you to become completely set free. Pray for me. I'm not there. I'm not there. But I'm getting better. I'm definitely getting better. When I came home Sunday and I, I thought about that, I thought, you know what? The best way to be healed from that is just to tell the whole congregation exactly why I did what I did and said what I did and just slap the devil just right across the face. And say, devil? Yeah. You want to keep jacking me around and, and causing me to represent Christ in a bad way or, or to just man up? And just say, man, just man up and say, you know, that's what it was about. You understand? All right. Love you guys. I hope this helped. We're going to do 12 weeks of this. We're going to break it down from this video. You can go online and watch this video again over and over and over, and I, I, I really would encourage you to do that. Okay? Sorry we can't just keep talking, but. <laughs> okay, Father, we thank you, God for your love towards us. You saw us in our sin and you made the great escape that we had to have through your son, Jesus. And while we were sinners, he died for us. And we became free. And he who the son sets free is free indeed. But Father, we also know that our freedom comes in levels of truth that we receive and then ad adapt or take it to live by and it becomes the truth and it becomes the controlling uh, words out of our mouth and I ask you Lord God to bless each one of us right now as you're transforming us on this day bless us Lord God I pray with your strength in Jesus name Amen Hey God bless you all Thanks for coming. I think there I counted uh, 17 of us. So that's good. And uh, let's, let's get our Wednesday night crowd going here and, and uh, enjoy the Word of God together. Children.